remember the stages, because it's important, we wanted to really grill it in our head, what the stages were for doing a process improvement project. It was defined. So everybody put your arms up. You're going to define what your project is. You're going to measure. You're going to analyze it. You're going to improve it. And you're going to control it. Okay? That's all. I just need you to stand <laughs> Focus. 
team of facilities, I thought it would be great. I'm going to go, I'm going to look at small to large facilities and see how that pans out. I'm going to try to catch every method that people are using generally in their transportation service. Okay, now this is interesting because up front I, I collected more data than what I needed. However, as I was going through, there were the time limitations, those constraints on me. But also, as I collected the data from the size of the facilities, their workflow patterns were so different that some of the things that I wanted to compare, in addition, I could not. There's just, it just wouldn't have been fair. And you definitely want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples as much as possible. So that was spoke out later in the project. But up front, I decided when I was going to collect the data, I was the only one collecting it. I'm only going to collect it on day shift. And and that was it. The techs at each of the facilities were dedicated staff. So I wasn't concerned about tech to tech variation, weekday to weekend, and shift. I was just going to keep it as simple as I could. The rest of these, um, I scoped out some of them up front, some of them as I went. The one thing on here, though, observation limitations, I think this one's important because as far as Lean Six Sigma goes, this is how you really determine your Sigma quality level. And it's based on the true errors that you're seeing as the process or product or service comes out. How many customer complaints, how many defects did you really observe? I didn't do that. So I did my um, quality, again, like I said, based on the number of steps and the number of opportunities for error, just to simplify it in the month that I had to get all this together. All right, so I looked at all the methods, so a manual, two <coughs> the gel, and then I looked at the ProView that I built in the Tango. And of course, the facilities I chose were based on where I'm from. I'm living in Texas. I've been in Texas the last 12 years. I know the military well. I have a foot in the door. They had all the methodologies. How beautiful. So the only place I had to step out of the military side of the house was um, Chris de Santa Rosa, was the children's hospital in San Antonio that I got for the two methods. So I cover them all. All right. When you start, to, when you're in the defined phase and you're starting to scope out your project, obviously, there's tons of things you can focus on. It's huge. So generally you do a high level process map. You make it real simple. And just by doing that, then the other people that are on your team may not be totally familiar with the entire process. They may be technically proficient at a certain point of it, whatever. But you start off with the high level process map and you work down. And each time you do another one of the steps in these phases, it focuses you more and more on where your biggest errors are, and where you're going to put the most effort so you can get the most significant improvement. So this was the start. Okay? And this was something that kept popping up in the discussions, the presentations earlier today, in the morning. Well, um, the one was, I don't know why we had such a big variation in what the allergic reactions, with transfusion reactions, you know, why that was. And I really think, in my mind, I think operational definitions weren't the same. So it's really critical that you have operational definitions. These are really easy, simple <laughs> ones in this process. But sometimes things get hairy. And in fact, as I went, I found that my hands-on time, it was a little bit different from facility to facility because their processes were a little bit different. But it was hands-on time with the text. So because of that, I had to, to redefine it as I went. And that's OK. So in fact, as you do any of these, you can go back and redefine things, and you should. Everyone's on the same sheet. So now we're going to go to the measure phase. So I'm not even actually measuring yet. These are all the things I'm doing before I start measuring. Okay. So I did actually do detailed process maps for each of the methodologies. Okay. And like I said, I did um, tweak some of my operational definitions as I went because they weren't as clear. So I added that. This is where I'm going to validate my measurement system or do the quality control run. I do that before I actually start collecting data. And then, even though I didn't do the pro process or performance capability, that's when I overlay how I'm performing in the process with the customer's requirements. Even though I didn't necessarily do that, there's some other preliminary things that when you collect your baseline data, you want to know because it tells you quite a bit about your process and what's happening. So we're going to go over normal and non-normal data, and is it stable and control? Real basic stuff, though. So now I'm going, going to go over into the detailed process map. Most of you, I'm 
sure have seen many of these different types of process maps. I focused on the swim lane map. I think the swim lane overall, generally speaking, is one of the best process maps. And what I found is that often you can better delineate roles and responsibilities by using this type of process map. You'll find, hmm, there's two departments doing the same exact process or step in a process. Why is that? Sometimes it's necessary, but often you find out that you didn't need to do that. So you can take things out right away. You can go, oh, we call those quick wins. Just fix it. Just take it out. If there's other areas, you're going to find also, oops, here's a critical step, and nobody's, who really does this? Well, sometimes I do. Sometimes this department does it. So that's why I love this map, because things will jump out at you right away. Things you either didn't know about your process or things you need to clarify. All right, so let's take a look. Here's the first process map. This one is the tooth method. And it's really kind of hard to read, obviously. It came out that each block, the way I did this, each block is a step. So if you add them up, it comes out to 32 steps it took to do the tooth method. Okay, and each red starburst indicates that there's actual a tech touching it or a human interaction that's required to, get, to keep the process going. So obviously every one of those has a human touch to it. Okay. So the process map is one of the lean tools, as you can see, that's been integrated into the measure phase of Six Sigma. Then you do a value analysis, which is really simple. You know, the Army loves real simple things. All of us don't get things real quick. So we like red, amber, and green. Red is bad, green is good, and amber is something in between. And this is generally the same rule. The red is non-value added. And the way when you get stuff on, well, it might be value added, it might not, is would your customer be willing to pay for it? That's the question. You know, so that's why it's really important you define who the customer is. The yellow is often very closely related to, it's either an intermediate step that has to happen for the next critical step in the process, or it's a regulatory requirement or a safety feature, something like that. Green obviously is critical and good. So here, I'm actually, I'm very, very happy to see that they have no red boxes. That's pretty good, because if they have red boxes, then you look at how you can get rid of that red box right away. So it's a very lean for what's, for doing the two method, it's a very lean process. Just making sure there wasn't anything else I was gonna say with that. A good example of what could have been a red block that I would have expected to see there, would have been if they had a worksheet and they actually wrote down their reactions and interpretations and then went to their computer system and input it. But what they did is they went immediately as they shook the tube, they put their result right in the computer system. So that worksheet would have been extra opportunities for error, extra steps that you didn't need. Okay, so I just put two more up here. I didn't give them all to you. They're actually at the end of your handouts if you wanted to look at them. But I put them up just to show you, you can see these a little bit better. Obviously there's less steps because automation takes some of these steps out, but it also adds some, and in fairness, it adds some because it's a different process. And you can see it again, there's no red. They're pretty comparable kind of, there's a couple things that are different, but this is something I thought was pretty unique. And I thought it was good to illustrate it this way. These process maps, I didn't take to the level of detail that you really need to take them to, for every little thing that's done, because you wouldn't be able to see it. So pretty much for presentation purposes and to keep the five separate methodologies consistent, I did like an intermediate level of detail. So if I look at this closer, for example, if I'm gonna load the strips on the echo, each specimen that comes in, this is called a top-down process map. I've taken one step of the process and there's a sub-process underneath it. Okay, so as I wrote that down, well, shh, now I have red blocks. How could that be? And the only reason I'm bringing that out is I want you to look at that. If you're looking for, um, if you're looking for automation and you want to see what's going to work best for your facility, maybe this isn't a big deal for you. But you can see that you're adding additional opportunities for error because this has to happen with every specimen that comes in. You have to identify, pull out the strip, put it on the micro. Open the drawer, load it, close the drawer, and then put the other cartridge back in the package, set it aside because it has to stay dry, it has um, humidity requirements, right? You gotta keep it, keep it in the package, that kind of thing. Whereas, 
when you're loading specimens because there are so many scripts on that plate and the actual decision making or the loading from there happens on the analyzer. So it's not your person doing it anymore. So you load it once and it can be good for a lot longer, many more patients. Does that make sense? Okay. Anyway, I was happy there was no red. Okay, so I just threw them all side by side, kind of, so you could somewhat see that as you went through each method, we've gotten better and we keep getting better. If you want to minimize the number of steps, obviously there's less opportunities for error. And then the opportunities for error, I really figured out based on those sub-processes that you may not be able to see because I didn't show them here. But what I did is I counted those also and I put them on the slide. Now I do want to say, in addition to this, some of these hands-on opportunities for error, they weren't that high, but it also was very dependent on the facility because I did it off of what those facilities were doing. So there's, I can tell you, for the automated methods, those three were all performed at military installations and there were some additional steps based on the LAS requirements and how they did it. So if you did a study like this, you're going to come out with different numbers, as you should. And thank God that I'm working for this company because the typo did come out the best. I didn't get fired yet. All right, so operational definitions. I just put this up here as a job aid. This is what I prepared for myself. So when I went out to collect the data, my data collection plan was the worksheet in the background, and then I came up with my original operational definitions, had them all typed in there, and I just kept it handy. So as I collected the data, I didn't get confused and go, wait a second, when was my start and stop for this particular step? Just to make sure I was as confused as I could be. All right, so now based on, this is the stuff I love about these six signals. So I was taking continuous data or variable data, time measurements, and because of that, Lean Six Sigma is going to tell me what method I'm going to use to quality control my measurement system based on the type of data. So I was going to do a gauge R&R. And the gauge R&R actually stands for my gauge, my measurement system. I'm going to check the repeatability and reproducibility. Very simple. Okay, so the way I did it, I pulled this up. This was my phone. Just pretend it's my phone with my timer on it. And each of the facilities has a wall clock. So if I left my phone and I walked around to walk, observe what they were doing, or I glanced at the clock, I wanted to make sure that whatever time measurement I used, it was going to be acceptable. So I clicked this time on the clock and I start my timer, and then I check the time again, and I compare them. That's all they do, and they do it a certain number of times. All this shows, it's really, it's, they show you a picture and then they give you a result. I only have 0.02% variation in my measurement system, which is great. If you're collecting data, let's say I had 30% variation in my measurement system. Well, that means that 30% of what I'm collecting, it could be the measurement system that's giving me the variation, not my process. So you want to really make sure that the data is telling you what you think it's telling you, and it's not your measurement system that's skewing it. Okay, so that's the reason for that. All right, so now I'm going to collect the data. And like I said, with Six Sigma, they like to always give you a graph, a graph or a picture, because it says a lot more. People can usually take that in, whereas if you just give them lots of numbers and data, they just blaze over, and it doesn't mean anything to them. So with this, I kind of talked about the normal chart, right, and 93% of all your data points should fall within three standard deviations, right? So that's what you see up here, and that generally, that's normal data. At least it looks normal. I guess that's how I really need to say it. It looks normal, but how do I know it's really normal? These charts I just threw on here to show you some variation that your data may not be normal. So it's great because Six Sigma, you, gets, you get this statistical um, software with it called Minitab, and it does it all for you. You just have to do like the general statistics and it chops all this out. So if I look at this histogram, I did the graphical summary, I get the histogram. This blue line, that looks pretty normal, yeah? Do you agree? But the way you determine that it's truly normal or not is by looking at the p-value. And I'm not going into all the statistics and how you get there. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, then your data is considered normal. If it's less than that, it's not normal. So that's critical because if it's normal, then the central tendency that I'm going to look at, the mode or mean of central tendency is the mean. I'm going to focus on the mean. So I can run this set of statistical analysis for normal data. If my data is not normal, then I'm going to use my median and interquartile range. Okay? And it's just helping you determine what's the 
stable. And I'm sure we've all worked with control charts, but I'm not certain that you know there are seven different types of control charts depending on the type of data you're collecting. So again, Six Sigma shows me that I'm going to do the IMR chart for this one. And that's the individual and moving rate chart. The top chart's showing the exact data points. And what, I guess I'm going to do a quick review over how to read the control chart just in case. So the red lines are your upper and lower control limits, right? And they're calculated based on the data you collect. Okay, and they're the, the three, plus three and minus three standard deviation. Okay, the mean is the green line in the middle. So the top one is all your individual data points you collect. It. The moving range chart on the bottom is calculated by the difference between 0.1 and 0.2, that's your data point there. The difference between 0.2 and 0.3 is your second data point. So the way Lean Six Sigma looks at this, this is your short-term performance. That's how you're really performing immediately. But long-term performance is generally there. Okay, big deal. So would you say this data is in control based on what you see? Euler, Euler, anyone? <laughs> okay, well, yes, it's in control. I'll answer for you. But notice you got like um, that point right there. That's an outlier, right? It's outside of the 3SD. In Lean Six Sigma, they don't want you using any data points unless you can account for what caused it. So that would be considered a special cause variation, something significant or different than what normally happens in your process happens to cause that. Okay, so I went and looked, and that was the telephone interruption. Okay, that happened. Hmm, do I keep that data point or not? Do I have telephone interruptions normally in the lab? Yes, so I'm gonna keep that data point. Well, also while I looked at this facility, they did their annual, their, that one year um, fire drill that you have to document, at least everybody leaves the lab. So we did, we left the lab, and I thought, hmm, would I have included that data point if that was the outlier? I would say no, because that's not a normal part of your process. So you're not gonna say, it just happened to happen while I was there. So if that were because of the fire alarm, I would not have included that data. And down here, this was kind of a joke that the supervisor shared today, but that uh, difference in time was because of the supervisor sitting in front of the tech <laughs> I saw her walk in and I just went, oh God. <laughs>
and then up here is our outlier, the asterisk. Okay, so by looking at these two blocks, these two different data sets, hmm, what could you say about box number two? Do you think they have more variation in their process or less variation?
But I have to say, even though it wasn't it was just wasn't the best study. That's that's really it. He still ended up. The tango did have the best metrics. He did perform the best. So in the future, I really do want to find someone who's got the other instruments and that has a comparable workload, so we can really do a valid study to see if there is a difference. And I'd like to look at the defects. I'd really like to see what defects. Now that would be a much longer study. But that's what Six Sigma is about. It's really about the errors that you really truly see, not just the opportunities. They want to really see how you're performing. So I have to do that with real data, not just estimating like I did. Okay? And I really want to look at the manufacturer, uh, the manufacturer's specifications, what we say our runtime should be. You know, of course we're going to present everything in the best light, but I want to see because I knew how Brook Army Medical Center had that compounding of, of runs on top of each other. I really want to see if I have another facility with comparable workload for that. I want to see what the test runs, how, vari how variable that is. Because I think that's good information and that will help you decide which automated 